So um, I'd like to pass the floor in just a moment now to Patricia Torres, the Global Head of Sustainable Finance Solutions at Bloomberg. Um, I referenced that we we're honoring Henry Kravis last night. We're happy to have had the, uh, a tribute from Michael Bloomberg for, for that um, uh, program for tomorrow night. Um, Patricia, I think that this really is a, you know, an exceptional uh, panel. I've had the real pleasure of getting to know Stan Bergman over time, uh, the CEO of Henry Schein. Uh, you know, if there was ever a business states person, you know, who cares and who cares about the future, it's Stan. Um, we're very, very happy to have Laurel Patterson, who's um, responsible really for the integra integration of ES uh, SDGs across uh, the UN system um, from her perch at the UNDP, and um, someone who's become very well known in her own right uh, on ESG subjects, Alison Fenton Willock. Um, Patricia, I'd like to hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and I would like to start um, by, by welcoming you to the second panel, the letter S in the ESG, Focus on Social Inclusion. So let me start by affirming that now is the time to build back better and create a more sustainable corporate world. We need to create social transparency and think about the impact on people, as Sir Ronald Cohen shared in his remarks earlier today. I have three great panelists with me today and, and, and we will share their insights and how they're leading the change from a social perspective. So COVID-19 has brought to the forefront how the different stakeholders, workforce, community and customers could impact a company's bottom line. Investors see employee satisfaction, worker safety and diversity as material factors. So my first question goes to you, Stanley. Henry Shine is a Fortune 500 company. As a CEO and chairman, could you share some recommendations on how to set goals for senior leadership on diversity and inclusion? And how important is diversity to you? And which challenges do you have? Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Peter and the BCIU group, thank you for hosting this really, really relevant topic. Uh, companies, NGOs, business leaders, government leaders are all coming to grips with the importance of ESG now through the COVID period and COVID and post-COVID. And at Henry Schein, we are indeed committed to a strategy that embraces strong engagement with all of our stakeholders, our suppliers, our customers, our team, uh, our investors, and in general society. There's a sense of purpose that really is important. And it's not only Henry Schein, by the way, it is companies in general that are really now committed to the notion of purpose. The whole concept goes back to Benjamin Franklin 200 years ago, the concept of enlightened self-interest, doing well by doing good. Uh, Henry Schein is, of course, at the nexus of healthcare providers. We service about a million healthcare providers around the world million and a half practitioners and work with about three and a half thousand manufacturers who create these products that are used every day by physicians and dentists in their practice. Ultimately, it is the credibility we've built over time through our commitment to creating shared values for business and society that go back to the founding of our business almost 80 years ago that has enabled us to bring together key partners so effectively and drive our long-term success. This deep, rich history has allowed us even in the middle of the pandemic and amidst the social justice moment in the US and abroad to continue to push the needle on our overall ESG strategy and accelerate our progress for divert in our diversity programs and our inclusion. Diversity, yes, but it's actually the inclusion that's important. And we want to ensure that our ESG efforts has the attention of the highest levels of our company, which include our board of directors, our nominating governance committee is actively involved, and so are many of our directors who are directly involved in the DNA programs in our company. Our DNA mission is to promote an environment for the team, for Team Shine members, where diversity and inclusion thrives to, to best support the diversity of our customers and the patients that they serve and society at large. From a culture point of view, 
We use the power of inclusion to foster entrepreneurship. That's entrepreneurship in a large company for our team members driven by our core values. We have employee resource groups, of course, the ERGs, which are employee networks, team networks. During the pandemic, these ERGs were critical in creating a community amongst many team members throughout the world. That was the beauty of this new digital environment where people from around the world can get involved in different communities and ERGs driving round tables between various teams around the world, all with the goal of impacting this terrible coast we have in this country and abroad of racism, which has been brought to the forefront, thank goodness, at this moment in time. Of course, in addition, uh, we use DNI to drive talent recruiting. We track and analyze our DNA statistics, public release that data through our CSR report. Uh, in 2019, we had 19,000 Team Shy members, over 8,000 in the US, 55% male, 45% female. Women account for 27% of Henry Shine's board of directors and 30% of our direct and above level in the company and 42% of our uh, uh, general team. Minorities account for 13% of Henry Shine's board of directors 14% of our directors and above a level a recruiting the rebel uh, uh, management level. We public release our 2000 uh, in 2019, our employee demographics data. We've been doing this for a while. We track various areas of importance from a DNI point of view, but again, it's not only the D that's important. It's the inclusive part. D is important, but really, really important to ensure everyone's included, included. We're focused on listening to our team. Very, very important. Diversity and inclusion uh, is so important that we have now a diversity inclusion council involving board members, uh, senior management, general members, director levels in the company uh, and above and team members throughout the company. In addition, the marketplace for diversity is important. In our world, we want to support healthcare professionals so that the profession looks like the population in general. Very, very important. We've been involved in this for over 20 years, actually 28 years. We convened, convened the first minority dental service provider summit and Marriott Airport here in New York City. So in summary, uh, ESG is very, very important for us. Patricia and the rest of the panel look forward to having a great discussion with you on this critically and relevant topic. Thank you. Fantastic. It's impressive, all the statistics that you mentioned and the transparency um, that you brought to the panel. Did you face any challenges whilst you're building that diversity and, and inclusion within your company? Of course we have challenges. And yes, the issue is how to make this live, Patricia. And for me, the big moment came and for the entire company when I was in a position to hear stories from women in the company of how the notion of trying to grow was held back by people that did not really understand how women are impacted in the marketplace and in recruiting. Of course, I, for example, have a wife who is a pulmonologist, never experienced any issues of unconscious bias. But when I heard and the team heard in a big public environment in the company, a town hall, how women were impacted by unconscious bias, it became real. And that was the momentum that drove much forward in the company. Um, that's, that's awesome to hear that you have those sessions with women where women can actually share their views and that you're listening and you're trying to push and change like the company. That's amazing. So maybe Alison, over to you. What about Blackstone? What policies um, do Blackstone have today to foster diversity in the companies that you invest in? Can you tell us more about Blackstone's diversity and inclusion efforts? Sure, uh, Patricia, first let me extend my thanks to the Business Council on behalf of Blackstone for extending the invitation to us to participate in this conversation. It's a topic that 
we care deeply about. ESG is an important focus area for the firm. Um, and that includes a commitment towards advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when and where we can. So, so thanks again for the invitation. Uh, and you know, we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion internally at the firm. But given that your question focused on or asked about what we're doing across the portfolio, I'll just try to get my answer to that specifically. We, we recently launched two really important initiatives at the firm to further take this commitment to diversity across the portfolio. First was a commitment to board diversity at our portfolio companies where we make control investments. We have established a mandate to target at least one third diverse representation on the boards of our portfolio companies. Um, we believe that having diverse perspectives elevates the quality of decision making. We think it contributes to a successful um, business outcome and contributes to positive culture at our firm. And so it's something that we've worked on internally at Blackstone. Um, if you look at our own board, 44% of our independent directors are diverse um, and 31% of all of our directors overall on the Blackstone board are diverse. We also focus on, you know, the diversity statistics in our incoming analyst class where we've gone from less than 20% female about six years ago to now around 45% female. And if you look at our businesses across the firm, about 60% of our primary investing businesses and corporate groups have a diverse professional as one of their top two leaders. And so what we're doing is taking all of the learning that we've gotten from advancing these efforts at the firm and really driving that across the portfolio through these initiatives. And so as I mentioned before, the first is, is this target to make sure that when we are investing and taking control positions in companies and we have the ability to influence who's on that board, that we're really intentional about finding diverse professionals and that we're, we're slating those seats with at least 30% diverse professionals. And the other initiative that we've launched is our Career Pathways Program, um, which focuses on you know, increasing employment opportunities for people from underserved neighborhoods and creating broader career opportunities and economic mobility for them. And again, this is taking a playbook out of what Blackstone has done internally, because essentially what we're doing for our portfolio companies is we are diversifying the methods that they use for recruiting talent. And we're just sort of introducing to them another angle for finding really high quality candidates for open roles at the portfolio companies who just happen to come from neighborhoods where the opportunities might not have been made known to them. Um, and so we are working with nonprofit partners to you know, launch the program in a pilot way across six of our portfolio companies right now. And the intention is that once the pilot is completed, we'll be able to launch it more broadly across the portfolio. It's really intended to you know, allow our companies to meet their hiring needs by tapping into a network that they might otherwise not have been able to tap into or not have thought of tapping into. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so I think I'm going to be asking the next question to Laurel. Um, so we have heard um, from Stanley and also from Alison all the great things that they are doing in terms of their companies, how they are trying to decrease the social inequality that we see in gender. Um, Lauren, um, I know that UN and, and, and the SDG number five is focused on gender equality. How much progress have you seen in terms of SDG number five, especially um, after COVID, where we know that so many women were impacted by, by COVID-19 um, in terms of gender-based violence or lower pay or unpaid care work? Could you tell us where we are today in the world in terms of gender equality? Patricia, thank you. And also to Allison and, and Stanley, it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this discussion with all of you. I mean, I think what we were seeing, Patricia, is that there was progress being made, uh, slow, but still steady progress being made in certain metrics in the SDGs towards gender, equa gender equality. But what our studies would show is that at that rate of progress, it would take us 100 years to close the gender equality gap. And we don't have any of that time. And of course, it's getting worse as a result of, of COVID and what many are calling the shadow pandemic, which is the pandemic of gender-based violence, which is rapidly increasing. 
uh, what we've seen is that as hospital beds are filling up, so are shelters nearing capacity. And what we find as well, and I think important for a group like this, many women, this is not something that they report, not something they're willing to talk about. So our studies would show that less than 40% of women report this kind of a, an issue at all and less than 10% to the police. So how are we opening up spaces uh, so that this kind of discussion can come forward? How are we ensuring that services and other forms of support are available? And a, a big part of this, I think when we're looking at, at, at gender equality, is also to look at the tremendous benefits of women's empowerment overall. In countries that have higher levels of female representation in parliament, they sign more environmental treaties. When women are involved in peace processes, those processes are more inclusive, they're more durable over the long run. And at the center of this is, is economic empowerment. And I think there's a really important role for this community here too, in terms of care services, in terms of education, and in terms of reskilling, and also the choices of investments that are being made. So we see, for example, that in the field of renewable energy, the jobs that are produced tend to have higher gender parity than in traditional sectors. So there's a lot of ways, I think, that we can make progress uh, against the challenges that we're seeing caused by COVID. We've also seen the tremendous benefit of women's leadership uh, in countries and industry and others through the COVID pandemic. So I think there's, there's actually a lot of strengths that can be built on. We're dealing with a set of challenges that were there before COVID. We're exacerbating that was already there. And, and, and Stanley has also spoken to this uh, in terms of other aspects of, of, of social inequities. So I think we need to ask ourselves now, what would it take? And to me, what would it take is not only how we're running our companies, how we're running our businesses, what are we producing and who is that benefiting? Who's at the table and who's not at the table? What needs to change? Even what we found in the studies and, and the assessments that we've done uh, in terms of COVID impact in countries and how governments are reconsidering their priority areas, women tend to be at the table the least in the discussions on transition to a green economy. And this is where they're needed the most. So I think starting to look at some of these bigger questions uh, can have a really a powerful positive impact uh, in the world going forward. Thank you. I love your answer. Um, Alison, back to you. So um, private equity, managing a portfolio of companies. Let's go deeper into the social metrics. Um, and we heard about the gender equality. So which, which social metrics do you look for um, when investing in companies? Um, is equality one of them? Any others you can share? It's a really tricky question to answer. Um, you know, we, we take a very customized approach to our ESG diligence. Well, first, let me back up and say that in, this, in, in the context of our ESG program, one of the things that we really try to do is to make sure that we are understanding the full ESG profile of target companies that we are considering for investment before we invest in them. And that diligence, um, those insights allow us to understand risks as well as opportunities. And there isn't a standard set of metrics, for example, um, that we can say always apply. Certainly diversity is always something that we look at. Um, we always you know, make sure that we understand whether or not our companies are violating human rights and employment law norms and, and all of that stuff. Um, but we really try to take a very customized approach to our ESG work. We, we look at companies based on the nature of their operations, what sector they're in, what geography they're in, and understanding the, the company in that way will lead you to looking at different metrics depending on, on what the company is. Certainly on the diversity side, one of the things that we monitor across our portfolio is diversity both in the overall workforce at our companies as well as at the C-suite and the director level. And we do this both in terms of gender and race and ethnicity. Um, and so we try to capture those statistics across the entire portfolio so that we're monitoring how our companies are performing. Um, but then there are some other topics within the ESG universe where it really isn't that cut and dry, where we really are taking a bespoke approach depending on the nature of the company and what it is that they do. Thank you, Alison. Um, Stanley, maybe just asking you the question now from a corporate perspective, how easy or difficult it is to actually get the board and the leadership team behind you? How do you get them behind your vision? Because as, as you share, your vision is quite impressive. 
when when it talked about like diversity and inclusion. So how do you get how do you mobilize the entire company to be behind you? That's an interesting question, Patricia. For us, DNI, ESG are terms that kind of developed in the last few years, but have been really part of our culture since the doors of the business were opened 87 years ago. So it's in the DNA of our team and our board members were recruited with the basic understanding that yes, they have a fiduciary responsibility, but that's the given. We want our board involved in the company's, advancing the company's values, which of course involve inclusion. I'm a very, very nervous about the D part, measuring statistics only. Of course, it's important that the statistics be good, but it's the I, the inclusion, that is so, so important. And this is where we have been able to engage our board. If you look at some of our board members, we've had a former Secretary of Health who had uh, uh, probably the min leading minority uh, physician at the time. He had to retire because of age. We had a former FDA commissioner. Uh, she had to leave our board because she had to take the role of FDA commissioner. Um, it's public record that the president of Harvard was on our board. These are all people that were recruited for our board because they believed in the mission of the I. The D is relatively easy. You can hire, but it's the I. How do you get people involved in eliminating unconscious bias? How do you involve the board in actually meeting with the team? And we, we ask, we don't require, I was gonna say require, but we ask and the board volunteers to meet with our team in general. And the board is involved in our diversity inclusion council, in our ESG programs and our ERG programs. So the bottom line is, if it begins with purpose, Companies that are committed to purpose find it relatively easy. It's not good enough to actually have the statistics. You've got to be authentic about it. And I believe there are many companies who have this as part of their DNA, but are struggling on how to express it as a mathematical formula. And that's going to be the challenge over the next three or four years, turning the DNA of a company that's committed to ESG into a company that is reporting that environment to its shareholders. Alison, if, if I may just taking, um, asking you like a follow-up question about the purpose, Stanley mentioned that, that transition, right? That purpose needs to be at the core of what the company is and the values of the company. When you are looking at companies and the portfolio of a company or a company that you like to, that, that, that the group would like to invest in, have you seen a shift on how the companies are coming to you about their, their values and, and, and where they see ESG and the social side. Do you see that narrative surfacing now more than ever? Yeah, if, if I can, I wanna also comment on something that Stanley said earlier, which I actually agree with. I think that when we're measuring diversity or evaluating diversity, equity and inclusion, there needs to be some caution to not just measure metrics um, there are ways that, especially in our role as GPs um, in the private equity context, you know, you can ask companies to report on the statistics of their workforce, or you can ask companies to report on the processes that they have in place to advance diversity or equity or inclusion within those companies. You can ask about certain practices and figure out whether they exist or not. And so I do think that, you know, that combination of questions related to process and questions related to metrics when taken together can give you good insight. Um, and I do agree with Stanley that focusing on metrics alone can sometimes exclude some of that process information that's really revealing. Um, and so I think you, you, know, you do need to look at both. And then to your question, yes, absolutely. We, we, you know, companies I think are very mindful of sustainability in general, um, ESG issues like diversity and how they impact their reputation. Um, and so we do see companies being more forthcoming about that information in diligence, for sure. Um, Lauren, now, now let's, let's talk about the future. Um, so 
I believe the United Nations released a report last week about the impact of COVID-19. So what will the future look like? Uh, what must be done today to continue to accelerate progress towards a fair, resilient and green future? Could you give us some insights into the report, the key findings? Thank you, Patricia, I will. I'll start by saying the future is as uncertain as it was before. And I think, you know, partly what we need to get our, our, our heads around is exactly this, even with the best metrics and data in the world. Um, we certainly didn't see this pandemic uh, a couple of years back. And, and, and I think we, we need to be uh, cognizant of what we use to, to, to try to manage those uncertainties uh, and, and update that with some of the, the reality checks that we've had through this pandemic. So we've had a report that has just come out where we've partnered with University of Denver, a longstanding partner of ours, and we've modeled a couple of potential futures uh, that we could see as a result of, of COVID impact. And I would say the startling headline is that we could see up to a billion people in poverty in 2030 as, um, as a result of COVID. What that would mean is that of that total number of a billion people in poverty, a quarter of a billion of those people will have been pushed into poverty as a direct result of the pandemic and its longstanding and its cascading effects. Uh, and so that, that's deeply concerning. It's also concerning from a gender poverty perspective. There's already a gap, it would widen. It would widen especially for the age group of 25 to 34. That's a childbearing age. That's a hugely important age for people professionally and in, in, their, in their jobs and professional career. So, so that's very, very concerning for us. Now, we created a scenario, uh, and, and I can share the links with colleagues to, to work through this. We've modeled all of this on a data insights platform that we have. It's all based on historical national data, so you can work through these scenarios for any country, download the data sets, and, and perhaps there's some interesting insights for this group as well, too. But it's to say that we modeled a scenario around 48 parameters of a set of integrated investments that countries can make. And what we found is that in that scenario where those investment choices are made, interventions, policy choices, et cetera, you would actually end up lifting 146 million people out of poverty and you would be reducing uh, the gender poverty gap. You'd also be disproportionately benefiting for people that currently reside in countries that are more uh, fragile or, or, or more prone to, uh, to different types of, of risk. So I think part of the message from this report and, and certainly for this group here is that the choices we make now really matter. They always have, but we can see this now. It is not too late. This decade is critical for the kinds of choices that we need to make for climate, but not only, also for people. We've seen a level of inequalities that's completely unsustainable, and we are all experiencing, to different degrees, the impacts of that. So I would strongly encourage this group uh, really to... to um, have a look uh, at, at some of these reports, consider the interactions and the interdependencies between certain choices uh, that are made and, and let's collaborate. You know, the UN system is doing a lot of work with, uh, with ESG and, and, and different kinds of investments. I think what's really key, one of the big messages for me coming out of this pandemic is that solidarity is key. And it's not going to be because the UN comes up with something. It's not going to be because a different sector uh, has a magic bullet. There isn't one, but it's in the collaboration. So I think how we can work more closely together uh, is really important for, uh, for the upcoming decade. Thanks. Lauren, could you just give us some examples of the policies that you believe um, companies or countries could adopt? So, some examples of, you know, like what of what like the report is recommending? Right, so in terms of the parameters that we modeled for, um, for where you could see those, those improvements in, in global poverty levels, we've looked at investments in social protection floors, so particularly around health and education. We've looked in digital and broadband. Connectivity is key. It's a key parameter here. In terms of government effectiveness, reducing levels of corruption is absolutely fundamental. And in shifting patterns of production and consumption along, there's a, a couple of key metrics that you can find in the report as well too. And again, because we model this as a system of systems, it isn't any one of those interventions, it's in the impacts that they have on each other that can drive progress. Makes sense, yeah. So I think this is something that we're seeing from an ESG space. We cannot change the world alone. We have to join forces. We can all change the world and drive the change that is needed if we work together. 
Um, so having heard uh, what the future could unfold, which is up to 1 billion people in poverty, if, we, if nothing gets done, um, Stanley, over to you, like, how is your organization contributing towards this fair and resilient future? What can other companies take away from how you're managing the social strategy at, at your company? Patricia, I have to follow on what Laurel said because what she said is really important. And I'm going to narrow it a little bit and talk to all healthcare companies. Yes, we have made tremendous progress with PPE. We have really done an amazing job in some respects with tests. And yes, we're on the cusp of having a vaccine, but I am worried. I'm worried that these items are not gonna be made available to the developing world. The Northern Hemisphere will get product, but the developing world will not. Pandemics do not carry passports. Viruses do not carry passports. This, you may get enough masks in the United States or the UK or Germany, but if you don't give it to people in the developing world, the virus will not end. And in this country, I am extremely concerned with how we're going to distribute the coronavirus vaccine. Are those people in disadvantaged communities going to access the vaccine? It's not good enough to have it available through a drugstore, but the local physicians who are in these communities who may not have access to a wonderful drugstore, are they going to know that it's important? Are their physicians going to be positioned to explain to them the importance of this vaccine and even have the vaccine? I am worried. So, Laurel, you brought out some important points. We've made tremendous progress during this, vac this COVID period with PPE tests and vaccines, but will everyone get it? In the developing world and even in the wealthiest country in the world, will people that really don't know how to access this vaccine necessarily, or are educated in the importance of the vaccine, get access to it. Is there, do you, do you have any suggestion on how this could be addressed? Is there, um, have you talked to other peers in the industry and um, is it something that if the people that are listening to us today, any recommendation you can leave to the audience? How can we help to solve the... the well, look. Most of us in healthcare have been involved in one way or another with the government task forces, etc. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. I would say most of us in healthcare are involved in one way or the other with government task forces. And I think the government is actually, uh, through FEMA and HHS in the United States, doing a pretty good job. Having said that, we need to get to the next level of all working together the public, NGOs, investors, all need to work together to put pressure on the system to make sure that those, are the mo those that are the most vulnerable can access a mask, a test, and the vaccine. And when I say access, it's not only about finding a place to get the shot, that may be it, but there's gotta be education on the importance of the vaccine, and the only people, unfortunately, that can do that are really the trusted physicians. So we need to make sure that the physicians are in a position to do that. Many, we're all working on it. All I'm saying is that the S part for companies in healthcare doesn't just stop with diversity inclusion, that's important, but engagement in society to make sure that society is given access to PPE tests and vaccines. And that's public-private partnerships in general. BCIU holding this event as a great public-private partnership will advance this. We all need to make sure that everyone has access, not only the wealthy or those that are educated and have access to the internet. Exactly, the world needs to be fair. What about you, Alison, and, and Blackstone? What are the things that you believe other companies can take away from Blackstone to make sure we have a better future? I mean, I think, you know, what we're focused on, on doing, I think, any company can do, which is just figure out what it is about your business that 
that is unique and that gives you a platform to be able to make an impact, right? For us at Blackstone, what we have determined is that we can leverage the scale and the breadth of our portfolio to make impact. Um, and so that's what we have committed to doing. And that's what we started doing with a series of initiatives that we've launched recently um, that address climate change, um, diversity, both at the senior levels and at the incoming levels in an organization. Um, and so, I, you know, I think any company can do that, honestly. So it's time. So thank you so much for the amazing past 30 minutes. Thank you so much, Alison, Stanley. Um, and, uh, and, and Laurel, thank you so much for your contribution. It was a pleasure like, to be here with you. And now back to you, Peter, back to the third panel on, on G. Uh, well done, all three of you, and thank you so very much. And um, particularly to Stan, I um, uh, continue, and all of us do at BCIU, to gain inspiration from um, your vision and how you've turned uh, and, and, and never seeking the credit um, that you deserve, uh, Stanley, and to everyone at Team Shine, thank you. Um, 